Episode 184 of the Hot Nation USA podcast, and we're back doing regular episodes. Normal, no more holiday nonsense. No more just kind of phoning it in at the last minute. <laughs> we're actually doing a real episode this year. Yeah, it's the first one of 2021, and of course, I'm joined by my co-host Adam. Yes, and I am happy to be back into canon. We don't yeah. have to worry about, does this episode count? Does it not count? What episode is this actually? No, we're back in. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing, and I'm happy to be here. Right. Good. Damn it. Yes. <laughs> and we're still on Zoom because the Rona be crazy. There's hell. <laughs> there's hella Rona out there. So <laughs> that uh, being that we're on Zoom, that means we also have a guest. And this week's guest is Master Cicerone, Brian Reed. How's it going, guys? Welcome to the show, Brian. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to uh, drink some beer and uh, talk about potentially beer or other things. I don't know. I guess we'll see as we go. Drink some beer? Well, you can't do that because this is our dry January episode. <laughs> as I crack a beer and pour it. <laughs> don't worry. It's audio only, theater of the mind. You know, you have to actually watch the YouTube channel to prove that anybody's drinking on this episode <laughs> hold it up to my computer yeah. that that ginger ale that you're having looks really good yes. wink wink nudge nudge <laughs> but yes this week we're doing dry january because that seems to be the hot button issue across beer social media and you know, we wanted to talk a little bit about it and we also thought it was funny to bring on a master cicerone and not talk about beer <laughs> <laughs> So that's what we'll be doing. Yeah. We'll be talking about the second favorite thing of beer Twitter, which is sandwiches. Yeah, beer Twitter. One may argue beer Twitter has morphed almost entirely into just sandwich Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> which is fine with me because I mean I've you know I've been ride or die sandwich for a long, long time. So. Sandwiches are a unifying force. There's no, yeah, yeah. no two ways about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I was a founding member of a radical, you know, uh, a radical sandwich anarchy club known as sub club you know it's invite only so don't expect to get in there <laughs> but doesn't matter if you're a rich man or a poor man a good sandwich is the equalizer amongst that's right. all men and if you don't recognize that a burrito is a sandwich then you can't join sub club <laughs> <laughs> those Everything's are the rules <laughs> but uh with that in mind let's uh get into the first sandwich that we're talking about this evening yeah uh, uh, it, whoever would like to go first what, what first sandwich would you like to introduce you know i i guess i can kick it off if you want me to but i'm gonna sure. I'm, I'm gonna snipe a a, a blue chip prospect here in, in the sandwich world and go reuben mm. hard, hard to beat a reuben in, in my mind that's probably number one sandwich in the world yeah I mean, it's definitely the number one sandwich on this podcast. Yeah, it is number one sandwich on this podcast. So it sounds like I'm, a, I'm in good company. We, yeah, yeah. We're, oh, without a doubt. For sure. We ride or die when it comes to Rubens. I mean, that that's the that's one I, I got to pick because if you're in the mood for a Ruben, nothing else will will suffice. Nothing else will satisf satisfy like a Ruben. Yeah. So let me let me ask you this. When it comes to the Ruben. Did you have to work your way up to adding all the original ingredients when you were a kid? Like, were you a kid that had to not have the sauerkraut or not have the Thousand Island dressing? Or did you go whole hog freight from the start? I think I went whole hog from the start because I do remember as a really little kid, you know, I, I grew up in a, uh, my, my dad's side of the family is, is very, you know, like, you know, Western Pennsylvania mutt. So like German, you know, Eastern European Jew, uh, probably some like, you know, uh, Hungarian or, or something like that in there. And um, we always had sauerkraut for New Year's. Like there's at least several times a year, there was a large family gathering that had, you know, an abundance of sauerkraut. Uh, and my grandparents would cook it for like three days. So it was like, just pudding almost you know what I mean? <laughs> so, like the first my first couple experiences with it like 
I wasn't that crazy about it. I do remember, but it was one of those things where like my pap, if you didn't eat sauerkraut on new year's, like it was not, it was like a slap in the face. You know? <laughs> so, like, you but then I do remember, you know, pretty quickly on, you know, having it elsewhere and feeling like, okay, sauerkraut can be not pudding. Right on. Do you have a specific place that you get your Rubens from? I I feel like Rubens one of those things that's like kind of hard to mess up. Like you 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 can get a good Ruben a lot of places, and, and I think like that's part of the reason I love it is go to a place that you're not that sure about. You can get a Ruben, you're probably going to be sat leave satisfied. One I I love that I haven't had in a long time is uh, uh, Smallman Street Deli. Mm. Uh, it's just it's just been a while, but. I used to spend a lot of time up at uh, in uh, Wilson McGinley, uh, you know, distrib- distributing there in uh, in Lawrenceville, and just kind of right up the road in uh, in the strip. We would go up for lunch a lot of times with with some of those guys. But obviously, I haven't went hardly anywhere for like nine months. But <laughs> um, it's been a minute. But hard to beat that one. Hard to beat that one for me. Well, I think I have a challenger then. Yeah. Because the sandwich I'm talking about is also. A Reuben. <laughs> hey, that's and, a good looking unit you got there. Yeah. <laughs> and this one comes specifically from Patrick's Pub. Oh, right yeah. Right there I've in had, Moon Township. I've had that one. Yeah. It, it is, it's a little bit different than uh, some of the Rubens you get across the, the county and everything, but it's a three tiered Reuben. So it's built almost like a club sandwich and it has the little bit of bread in between. And I will say, though, it is one of the greasiest sandwiches <laughs> just because the toasted rye is so, so greasy. <laughs> but, man, is it worth it? And just, you know, you're talking about, like, sloppy, gummy sauerkraut. And, yeah, it just dumps right out of the sandwich if you're not careful. See, that's a good-looking seeded rye there, too. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't get the the faux you know sometimes you see the marbled rye and a good marbled rye is really good but sometimes you see a marbled rye and it's an indication that they're trying to make it look like a good Reuben but it's actually not right like you know, like a you know, like a a gas station you know sandwich that has like the seeded rye or even the uh, marble rye kind of looks like that or like I think about like a an airport Reuben <laughs> like you're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> you're like i'm starving what is the the quickest thing and you grab something and it's like this is disappointing but that that looks legit yeah it is legit i've been many times i i would say that that is a sandwich of extremes where you either absolutely love yourself that day or absolutely loathe yourself that day when you want that sandwich Mm -hmm. yeah you're feeling self-destructive potentially Mm -hmm. but uh yeah, I, I will say the last couple of times I got the Reuben though from Pat's, it, I actually wasn't feeling either of those. I was feeling supportive because I wanted oh. to go, yeah, cause I don't, we used to go to Pat's like every month for a beer tasting club. And, you know, we would get, either, you know, I usually would either get a Reuben or they do a pretty good cheesesteak there. But like, we haven't been there that often. And I know things aren't as they are, you know, they're, they're definitely not open up the way they used to be. So I, so I like to go and support and I was being supportive that day and went and bought a Reuben from my favorite sandwich place. <laughs> Cause they also right, do I'd... a really good salmon, salmon BLT as well. I had no idea about that. Yeah. Check it out. Next time you're there. Good salmon BLT. Salmon BLT. It sounds borderline sacrilegious. I love <laughs> and I love salmon, but I don't know if I've ever had the combination. Yeah, it's it's worth it. It's worth it. So, Adam, what was your sandwich that you've chosen? So, it is not a Reuben. However, I do have to give a shout out to McNerney's in Oil City, Pennsylvania. Uh, you you got to have that hometown pride for their Reuben. If I'm going to get a Reuben, I'm going to get one from there as well. It sounds more it's, Irish. It, <laughs> Patrick's Pug, McNerney's. Yeah, it's more. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I got Irish blood in me. It's it's okay. Well, no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying from the standpoint of the sandwich, it was invented, uh, you know, in a Jewish deli, mm-hmm. you know, or it was actually invented at a hotel for a Jewish uh, delicate delicatessen owner. But in what like, state, Steve? Nebraska. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, but for having all these roots of like Eastern European, you know, it seems like a lot of Irish people love Rubens. 
guilty as charged. I love I, making I them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's been this, this, how did we get to a point where if you go into like, like kind of a, a, a not so authentic Irish pub, they always have some sort of like wonton wrapper with what is essentially Reuben ingredients in it fried. Yeah. It's like corned beef and cabbage or like a Reuben. Reuben sort of egg, egg roll is what I've seen. Yeah. Frank, oh. yeah. Frankenstein appetizer. Yeah. Like a Reuben egg roll. How'd that become a, a faux Irish pub thing? I don't know. That is a mystery to me. <laughs> <sighs> I'm not going to say I wouldn't eat all. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not right. Right. above picking, you know, four of those in my face. But <laughs> but to me, that's just sort of a tease because you, you get, you know, the flavors, but it's still not the sandwich. Right. No. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's missing cool. the bread. For sure. Mm-hmm. What is your sandwich, though, Adam? So my sandwich actually comes from uh, Industry Public House, uh, a fine watering hole. I've spent way too much money there. Uh, but their Model T turkey sandwich. I actually really like this sandwich. It's obviously a turkey sandwich with uh, with smoked turkey. You got your lettuce, your tomato, your onion, things like that. Uh, they, do, they do put some uh, some bacon on there. They call it their wild boar bacon mm-hmm. uh, with some gar- garlic aioli on a nice sourdough bread. Uh, Steve, I'll send you pictures. You can put that up on the uh, on the tube cast later on. Yeah, sure. It'll be up on the socials and everybody can enjoy it on the Instagram, yes. all that. <laughs> but uh, I, I like that that sandwich. I find that because uh, there are times where I kind of want a slightly drier sandwich. Mm-hmm. And this this one hits it just right. The turkey is is dry without being obnoxious, if that makes sense. Uh, I guess. I, mean, I, I, I feel like the turkey should be the moistest part of that sandwich. It's not, but I kind of like it that way. Okay. Yeah, you you lost me wholeheartedly at I like a I like a nice dry sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> I was like uh, what? <laughs> just the just the turkey itself is dry. It when you when you add in the bacon and the aioli and stuff like that, it kind of evens it all out. I gotcha. mm. It's not a drippy sandwich. It's kind of like yeah. running down your to your elbow sandwich. Right. It's not an interactive sandwich the way some others would be. Yeah, I, I, I get it. It's just like the, I don't want the turkey to be the driest part. I'm OK with like a drier bread that's toasted or, you know, like less sauce or like even if that wild boar bacon was, you know, like crisp and not drippy. Right. I'm OK with all that. But it's like turkey is such a like, I don't know, a delicate meat that needs to be prepared better. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I think it worked out well. I do eat another one. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> hey, man. You, when Don't you, judge me. I'm trying not to, but I also just kind of feel like, you know, the way you just came out for dry sandwiches is like <laughs> the is how everybody feels when I come out and say anti-Pilsner stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, A lot of people got mad and they're like... <laughs> Yeah, if you're gonna stand dry sandwiches, I don't know. I don't know how long <laughs> you're gonna get. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll come back and maybe talk a little bit about those sandwiches at the end of the segment. But for now, we're gonna get into our guest and find out a little bit more about him. And as we mentioned, he is a master cicerone, which is a significant honor because there's. Last time I checked, there's only 18, but is, is, has that changed since? Are there more master Cicerones at this point? Uh, there's 19 currently. Okay, yeah, 19 currently. One more uh, added last year. Um, the, exam, the, this, the exam's offered once a year. Mm-hmm. Um, usually about 25-ish people sit. Um, and, and, you know, on average, usually, usually about one person you know, passes a year, sometimes, sometimes two, sometimes zero, uh, one year, uh, there were three, that was actually the year I passed. Um, and, uh, obviously no one added this year, which is a bummer. Cause we thought we'd get to, to 20. Cause there's actually a handful of really, really promising candidates that I would expect next, next time they actually hold the exam. There should be at least, uh, at least one or two more. Awesome. How long did it take you to achieve the master Cicerone? Uh, well, it's it's kind of tough to answer that because um, as far as like from the time I, I started like really diligently preparing for it to the time I passed it, 
was probably about, you know, uh, probably about, about three years or so. Um, but from the time I took the, the cert, so I was a BJCP judge before I was, went down the Cicerone path. And I, you know, was, was brew, home brewing a long time before that, and then brewing professionally, and then uh, got in the commercial side of the business. Um, and then I, you know, um, you know, some, I became a beer educator uh, at Miller Coors, where Kraft, 10th and Blake was a craft and import segment for Miller Coors, um, and, uh, and started, you know, going down the Cicerone path. Uh, so from the first time I took, it was probably about five years from the first time I took the certified beer server to, to passing the master exam, but it took me three tries to pass the master exam. So uh, that, that was a big part of it. But, yeah. But still like, that's a, that's a huge backlog of education, you know, that you did, you did on your own because it was going through home brewing and then obviously working in the business. Yeah. yeah it was just all of, of just trying to weasel my way into the industry. You know, my, my, my formal education was, uh, you know, in, in business, um, advertising, PR and communications in undergrad. And then I went and got my MBA and my master's in journalism. So I have no formal, you know, I don't have a brewing degree or anything like that. Not that you necessarily need one, but, um, you know, I just kind of trying to get work experience and packaging and, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, eventually into sales and then started getting into new product development and things, um, at Miller Coors and, and beer education. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was just a long, long con way to, to grift someone into letting me do beer things <laughs> <laughs> work out eventually. So when you, when you started down the path, was there a lot of, of self-study going on that you kind of just had to sit down at the table and run through everything that you possibly could or did you have a mentor was there sort of a, a group of people that got together and tried to do this together or, or what was the process for that yeah that's a, that's a great question um all of the above i would say you know as far as um you know when i first started like really kind of seriously studying beer and trying to you know kind of build my my knowledge around brewing was when i was really really into home brewing um and i was part of trash uh which is you know the local homebrew club um, and uh, met a bunch of really great people there, many of which are, are professional brewers and, and brewery owners around the city now. Um, you know, it was like, uh, it was myself. Um, it was uh, well, Malcolm Frazier who, who worked at uh, um, uh, Fatheads, is now at Hot Farm, uh, Andy Kwiatkowski from Hitchhiker. Um, uh, let me think who else. Um, you know, Jack Smith, who was the president of Trash for a while. Um, uh, there was just uh, Jim Chaney's a professional brewer now. It was like, uh, you know, Keith Cost, who's a master BJCP judge and, a, and a, um, a, a professional brewer now. So it was a lot of folks who were all kind of in the same boat. Like we all had other jobs and day jobs and that sort of thing. And like just brewed like mad. Like we used to I used to brew every week. I used to brew at least at least five gallons of beer a week. And um, we had this little kind of sp split off group from trash called, um, we just call it the Brewers Gathering. And, uh, and Andy Weigel, who, who, uh, uh, who brewed at, uh, at Helicon, um, and we would all get together and, uh, um, you know, and just tear each other's beers apart, like really, you know, kind of with a scalpel, just pick every little thing apart and get better at tasting, um, get better at brewing. And uh, yeah, so we did that for a while. And then some of us started, you know, taking brewing jobs. Um, and then when I moved over to, to Miller Coors, I was really fortunate to be on a team with some people who have been in beer education for a while. Um, and when I started studying for the, for the master exam, I had a couple, well, I had, you know, several people, but among them, um, a guy named Jason Pratt, who's also a master Cicerone, um, and Dan Imdek, who's also a master Cicerone now. And um, the three of us really, really pushed each other a lot. Um, I lived in Milwaukee at the time. Jason lived in Chicago and, uh, and Dan uh, lived out in, in Colorado. He's now in California, but um, yeah, we just read each other practice essays and send each other beers and, you know, just kind of put each other through the ringer. And they're both extremely good tasters. So um, it was one of those things where it's just like impossible not to get better when you're spending time with people <laughs> that talented and 
you know, I was trained, it was fortunate because I was training people, you know, on tasting and, um, and, and style identification and, and brewing and all these things like on a daily basis. So it was really helped being able to like live in that world on a day-to-day -day basis and, and, you know, teach four or five beer classes a week. Um, you know, it was easy to stay motivated, you know, but there was definitely a lot of sitting in a little room in my house in Milwaukee. It was like this little office that was like up off the staircase and upstairs. And I just had all my books and um, they're not here right now, but like, and just an obscene amount of note cards, stacks <laughs> <laughs> and stacks of note cards. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting because the first time I took it, I, uh, I came really close and I didn't know what to expect at all. Um, and then the second time it was that, like, just have to do a little bit better kind of thing. Um, and, uh, I moved, had a, had a, a second kid, uh, and, uh, there was a documentary film crew following me around, um, the second time I took the exam and it was just, boy, it was, I was just kind of a head case going into it. And I actually did worse than I did the first time. Um, but then the third time kind of came back with a better approach, a little more focused kind of vision of, of, of how to get better and uh, eventually, eventually knocked it out. So that's awesome. Holy cow. Yeah. Oh, it almost sounds like you're going for, and I hate to use this phrase, the bar exam. Basically you're, you're, you have to immerse your life into it. Otherwise you have no chance. Yeah, it really was. It was, uh, it was definitely a, a, at least as many hours as, as a second full-time job. <laughs> it was, you know, <laughs> especially once it gets on the crunch time of the last, you know, few months before the exam, you're, you're, you're spending, you know, 68, 80 hours a week studying on top of, you know, whatever else. So luckily, uh, like I said, you know, lived in Milwaukee and, uh, you know, we didn't have as much, you know, friends and family there as, as, as normal. And we had two young kids. So we weren't really, my wife and I weren't really going out and she was extremely patient, um, and supportive <laughs> and poured me a ton of, you know, blind beer flights and all that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, it was, I wouldn't want to do it again. That's for sure. It was <laughs> pretty, pretty goddamn miserable <laughs> experience. <laughs> but I mean, it sounds like if it weren't for like the, the challenges getting through it, like 2020 would have been a really good year for people to study. Just if you, yeah. you know, if you had to immerse yourselves, well, then, you know, you're not going anywhere. Just get somebody to send you beer. Like that's, the, that seems like the biggest problem with that. Yeah. There's a lot of people. I mean, I, I do a lot of uh, education consulting on the side. I, I, I work in uh, the commercial side of the business again, uh, but I do a lot of uh, consulting on the side for, you know, just doing like talks and seminars and that sort of thing. But I, I also, Malcolm, who I'd mentioned before, Malcolm, I do a, uh, uh, beer education for the for the Pittsburgh Brewers Guild teach classes and you know we're doing some videos and things like that people can utilize during you know lockdown and all that but um the uh uh, uh there's a, another group of, of of folks that I'm actually who are preparing for the advanced level which is the the third level of four um who are doing that exact thing like they are meeting three times a week um, you know, they're shipping each other beers, they're writing, you know, I write the practice essays and then go over them with them and grade them and that sort of thing. So yeah, I think a lot of people are using this opportunity to, to hunker down and yeah, get some, get some, some studying then. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It, it, do the best with what you can. I mean, what is, what is that uh, saying for every crisis, there's an opportunity or something like that? Yeah. Sure. It, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, some, some proverb I obviously don't know well enough. <laughs> that old chestnut. Yeah, uh, I do a lot of. Uh, yeah, I feel like I've been not. You know, besides from a couple things here and there like that, I feel like I've done the exact opposite for the last nine months. I've just like watched movies and drank beer and gained twenty pounds. Well, <laughs> hey, that's you know that's the rest of us. You know, we we don't have anything left to learn. We know everything, so we don't have to. <laughs> It's okay if we sit around and watch movies. <laughs> I already reached the mountaintop. Yeah, I tried to teach myself Blender for two weeks and then just gave up on it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all right, so a lot of your education and a lot of the education that goes into the Cicerone program is just identifying taste, but also knowing how to pair beer and food. So yep. 
obviously that's kind of why beat or Twitter has such a hard on for sandwiches and food in general, because, you know, it goes into the education and it's a part of, you know, who you are. Uh, if you had to guess what level of Sando Mollier or witcher would you be if you had to be a, you know, purely sandwich dealer rather than sandwich dealer. <laughs> yeah. Well, rather than a beer educator or beer brewer, <laughs> they already got the little baggies. So they're halfway there. Yes. <laughs> hard, man. It's hard to say. I, you know, a lot to learn, a lot to learn. Uh, I did not know what state, the Reuben was uh, originated in like you did. So uh, I would not have guessed Nebraska. I would have guessed like New Jersey or something. So I've got a little bit of, I've got a little bit of uh, a, a way to go, I suppose, but. This history yeah. learning. Yeah. <laughs> so you're thinking maybe like a level three, which around. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> which around sounds cooler than it actually is. Cause it kind of sounds like you're doing some like black magic shit. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> way more rad than, than, just making sandwiches but yeah that still sounds like brewing <laughs> <laughs> steve i think i i think we do need to look into the witcher own program a little more deeply or no, sando I, I don't know which one it is <laughs> sando Malier is way better actually <laughs> <laughs> see that's, I, think that's... There, I think there's something there yeah see sando Malier is the one where you know somebody opens a wine bar and then I come around with a servings, you know, small servings of sandwiches <laughs> and go, well, I think this would pair very well with your white or red. <laughs> I would go there. I would go to that wine bar. Full stop. Yeah. Is, is there, do you have any uh, like future upcoming uh, educational programs that people could get in on or just like uh, something people could watch as just kind of an intro? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, doing some stuff coming up if you're part of the um, uh, Pittsburgh chapter of the United States uh, Bartenders Guild. I'm doing something on the 26th with them. So if any, anybody uh, you know working in the industry in the, in the Pittsburgh area is part of that, we're doing a little seminar with myself and a, and a sommelier to kind of talk about some of the similarities and differences of uh, of you know beer production wine production and trends and we're going to talk about beer and food pairing and that sort of thing so i think that's part part of uh um of, of that organization um I'm trying to think what else we're gonna be doing some videos for the for the uh, pittsburgh brewers guild um but i think like i said for for guild members anybody who works at, at local breweries but we're still uh looking to schedule those doing anything for tulane university in in, uh, in illinois on the 28th, so anybody who's at Tulane University, I know you guys have a real deep listenership amongst the Tulane uh, student body. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I've gotten got right now. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, I, I usually do did some stuff for Carnegie Mellon last month, and um, it's you know there's always stuff popping up, but mm -hmm. uh, usually post something about it on social media or anything. I usually teach a lot of in-person classes for the Brewers Guild and for Cicerone, and obviously those have been put on hold for the time being. But yeah, yeah, I think I figure it's kind of hard to like really get those like off-flavor bottles out there, you know, for off-flavor training. <laughs> And then you well, have to you have to have somebody receive the mail and then hide those bottles from you. <laughs> well, that's exactly what we do. So, like, we'll we'll have like I'll make a list and send it to the group, and then I have the email addresses of roommates and significant others of those people who pour, who are prepared to pour for them, and then have to send them instructions with that. And and uh, you know, I tell them, hey, you know, it's coming in the mail. Don't open it, kind of thing. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so the whole uh, whole process worked out. It's, a, it's such a hard thing to do not open your beer mail <laughs> I know, you take the box and put the whole box in the fridge and yeah don't open it up so <laughs> you imagine being a, a roommate or a significant other that doesn't know what's going on all of a sudden there's a fedex box just sitting in your refrigerator <laughs> <laughs> this isn't food <laughs> live bait don't touch it <laughs> it's mice to feed to my uh, tarantula <laughs> Or as I always tell the folks at UPS, kitchen supplies. Yes. <laughs> I used to always tell them when I would ship beer and, and finally someone called me on it. I don't know why. This was like something from like way back in like, you know, homebrew days, you know, like a, a decade or 
15 years ago, people used to always say, just tell them their yeast samples. And so I started <laughs> telling people their yeast samples. And, uh, and eventually they were like, we can't ship yeast. <laughs> like after like 10 <laughs> years of coming there, finally somebody was like, knew what yeast was. Cause the whole thing was, you just say that and they just go, eh, I don't know what that is, whatever. Um, you know what I mean? I don't really know what that entails. But uh, yeah, eventually somebody was like, is it in liquid? And I'm like, well, yeah. And they're like, we're not shipping that. And I'm like, I guess I gotta come up with why, if you're going to lie, why not just say like, it sucks. You know what right, I mean? Yeah. Now I I'll just see. say, I say it's, it's commemorative glassware. Ah, I like that. Hmm. I, I, I had a FedEx box. I guess it was packed to the standard that the people with the office liked. So she took it, at, you know, took it apart and then found bottles in there. And she asked me what it was. And I was like, eh, it's soda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too. I had, uh, I, I've learned over the years, like a, a lot of packaging techniques and stuff to, mm-hmm. to you know, hopefully it won't, won't break, but I've definitely had some, some cans rupture and things like that. They were just unavoidable, but it happens until you've had, you learn that lesson the hard way. The first time you have like a fruited sour or something, you know, shatter in your luggage on the airplane. <laughs> and now all your clothes and shoes and everything that were in there are like purple or whatever. Oof. That's separate bags. Always separate bags. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I start, I, I, yeah, I t- tie everything up and, you know, trash bag, whatever I need to do, but. <laughs> you got to quarantine your, your out of state takes. <laughs> All right. Well, let's come back to the sandwiches we were eating this segment. Uh, obviously, Brian and I were both on the Reuben train because it is the best sandwich. I believe it's been voted on a couple times. And I'll, I'll say the Patrick's is the best in the Western PA area. I Now, now I got it. I feel like I've had it before because I've spent enough time at, at Patrick's that there's mm-hmm. no way I've had that sandwich before. But uh, yeah, Smallman Street, man, it's great. I mean, just, you know, classic kind of deli feel too. That's like part of, I think, the, the allure for me. Yeah, that makes yeah, that makes sense. The other one that gets talked about a lot is Riley's Poor House. I've not done in uh, Carnegie, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I haven't had it. Yeah, those, those are the only three I've ever heard, like really talked about. But yeah, so check those out if you're in the Western PA area. Get all three. Have a flight of Reuben <laughs> for dry January. And, and if you want to upset some people with a dry ass turkey sandwich. Yeah. And if you're a total noob, uh, go get this dry. <laughs> <laughs> go get a dry turkey sandwich from Industry Public House. <laughs> they won't even look at you when they serve it to you. <laughs> you can just feel the shame. You wanted this. All right, here you go. Yeah. All right. uh, I shouldn't well, I shouldn't make fun. They got beers there that I like. So yeah, yeah that's well, I've spent a lot of time. I actually spent a a very uh drunken evening there dressed head to toe in uh as Taylor Swift. Oh with a wig and lipstick and the whole nine yards. That is a perfect lead in for segment two. That that hooks the listener. <laughs> we'll come back and find out more about that. <laughs> And no more explanation required. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yes, we'll be back shortly with segment two. Hopefully Adam can redeem himself from dry ass turkey sandwich and have a better sandwich <laughs> in the next segment. And we're going to talk a little bit more about sandwiches as well as Brian's other favorite thing, horror movies. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to episode 184 of the Hob Nation USA podcast, and we're still here in dry January, not drinking beers at all, certainly not at all, (laughs) with our guest, Brian Reed. (laughs) Boy, oh boy, that's (laughs) worth going on the YouTube for. (laughs) There may or may not have been a tremendous amount of foam on that (laughs) That's a That's a real, real, like, you're drinking... (laughs) If, say, somebody was drinking an old German-style Dunkel <laughs> that had a lot of foam on it, he may or may not have just given himself a mustache extra. 
with why, it. Why? Why else? Why else would you have a mustache? Yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, yes, we are joined by Master Cicerone Brian Reed, and we're talking sandwiches because we can't talk beer during dry January. It's, you know, it's not the right thing to do. It's bad. I don't want to offend anybody. I know. Or tempt anybody who may be making that decision. Exactly. And a lot of people are making that as a healthful decision. So we're here to promote healthy styles of sandwiches, which is why I am bringing up this sandwich right now, because it is a healthy choice for dry January. The Philly cheesesteak. <laughs> <laughs> That is. Is. <laughs> oh yeah that looks that looks pretty tremendous actually although i think i see peppers on there which is not strictly speaking it not isn't no, so not ingredient yes so to be fair it is not from philly it is a homemade philly cheesesteak so but it is peppers onions steak and wit whiz on a big old roll that's what i created for myself just because, you know, like home brewing, there's also cooking at home. You know, a lot of people do that as well. <laughs> you've heard of you've heard of home brewing before, obviously. But yeah. did you know you can prepare food at home? Did you know <laughs> you can also like caramelize onions at home? <laughs> I'm learning so much on this podcast. I know. Well, you, you know, you have to you know, reach out to the rest of the audience and, you know, and just do a check with them. Maybe they're learning something new that they can, you know, they can create their own Philly cheesesteak at home. <laughs> it's funny when I, when I saw that immediately, I have uh, some, some, you know, friends and coworkers that, that live in Philadelphia and uh, um, have invited me to this Facebook group. It's called Philadelphia cheesesteak department. That's, that's, there's like a thousand members. It's not like a small group of people. Right. And the whole, pretty much the whole purpose of the group is people post pictures of cheesesteaks preferably ones that aren't from philadelphia and then everyone just mercilessly destroys them <laughs> that's, the whole, that's the whole group like it, it really is there's some really funny really funny people in there that are just like yeah go lay in traffic you piece of garbage because you have like <laughs> on your cheese <laughs> Well, if you, you know, if you want to feel free to take these photos with you and, you know, submit them to your group. Oh, I should actually. And then report back on what the, their response was. <laughs> they, will just, they will shred your life for having that big of pieces of steak and for yeah. having peppers and for having those big rings of onions. And they'll talk about too much bread and it could be perfect and they'll find something to, to, to <laughs> that's, that's yeah. the whole thing. So, so I will admit, I definitely do have too much bread on this because I was looking for like sub rolls and I couldn't find any sub rolls when I was at Walmart. So the only other choice I had was like this big French loaf. Mm -hmm. So I just cut. That's, I, a, that's a big thing too, is like they, <laughs> somebody will post that and they'll go French bread. Fuck you. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Hey, listen, I would happily eat that. It looks fantastic and i'm a whiz guy for sure so you can't you, that, that's it's just it's essential i listen i love provolone but it's not a cheesesteak yeah I just, fully, fully agree fully agree just doesn't work uh, and you know what it's the second best sandwich in philly too the, the cheesesteak in my opinion all right I mean, what would be the first it's got it's the the roast pork oh okay and, oh the roast pork is uh specifically i mean there's a lot of places that do it really great i'm not from philly obviously but denix roast pork as soon as i saw that i thought oh why didn't i put denix roast pork on here <laughs> but, uh, so good. steve i must say that that is one of the nicest photos of a homemade cheesesteak i have ever seen it's well well presented it's, uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm working, you know, I gave up on Blender. So now I'm working on my photography skills. <laughs> Can I say something? Yeah. Wish it was drier. <laughs> <laughs> I just wish it was bone dry. Like I, yeah. that's my only complaint. <laughs> yeah. That whiz is way too much. <laughs> too wet. It's too, too wet. wet. You can blow see on it and have some nice cheese dust fly off of yeah, it. Yeah, I want it yeah. to I want it, I want to choke on its dryness. <laughs> you can see the shine on the onions, and that's way too, way too much. <laughs> no, I can tell there's moisture in those onions. Mm -hmm. and it's, 
yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah they, were, they were fried in butter and, yep, yeah, that's too much. <laughs> so what is the second sandwich you wanted to bring to the show, though, Brian? Yeah, I, I will go for, and I have a specific one to talk about, but um, the, the, Italian, the Italian hoagie. I All love, right. I love me an Italian hoagie. Um, and it doesn't have to even be a good one. I just love, like, I get, I, like, I will happily eat like a two day old Italian hoagie that someone bought for someone's fundraiser somewhere. Like, I just love, I just love, you know, like salami, capicole, probably maybe some, some soppressata, if you're getting fancy, some prosciutto and then just provolone or mozzarella, you know, little oil, maybe a few herbs, maybe some roasted red peppers or something, but I just, I love a, I love an Italian hoagie. The uh, hot or cold, honestly, I don't even care. I just love me an Italian hoagie. I just made one, I was craving one the other day and uh, I knew I had some like meat left over from, from New Year's Eve and we made like a little charcuterie board. So I just stopped and got like some good bread and just like put a bunch of, you know, hot jardinera on it and Man, I just I could eat an Italian an Italian hoagie every day. Uh, agree. The only yeah. thing I'm going to correct you on is it's pronounced Hagee. <laughs> Hagee. 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 Well, that's what I was thinking about. Hagee. Hagee. <laughs> and it's not. It, I, so I was I was going to make a comment about how it's an Italian hoagie, like, but it and it's not an Italian sub, but yeah. I don't always say hoagie. Like hoagie is an Italian hoagie. Right, but if I was gonna say meatball, I'd say meatball sub. Meat, meatball sub, right? Yeah, yeah. I, and I'm I was saying. trying, I was trying to think like, is there a hard fast rule about when to say hoagie and when to say sub? But it really depends on the toppings. Yeah, I, I for me it's always Italian hoagie, but then like meatball sub is always meatball sub. But then like everything else that would come like that, kind of it's kind of up in the air. Yeah, but cheesesteak is also similar you know similarly prepared mm -hmm. but i would never say sub or hoagie for that no because no, it's, it's just cheesesteak cheese is a cheesesteak yeah right yeah, steak yeah. sandwich but yeah. it's not it's not a yeah i don't know why but I, I for some reason hoagie when i say i think italian hoagie i think <laughs> of selling them for like fundraiser for like baseball or, yeah i got them <laughs> joe corby italian hoagies <laughs> yeah like we're gonna go down and stand outside mary's giant eagle sell hoagies <laughs> like, that's, that's like what i think of a hoagie but i uh i i'm gonna pick a a, a superior hoagie than to the to the uh the ones you would sell for you know for for fundraiser or something like that and go uh carson street deli like right it's just that the the balboa if you've not had it it is i i mean borderline life-altering italian, <laughs> italian hoagie. it has like all the things you want it's got like the soprasad it's got the salami prosciutto it's got the gabagool you know it's got, <laughs> uh, it's got salami it's got provolone uh and then it's got the roasted red peppers really chewy bread like it's just it's pretty tremendous and also they have great beer and yeah if you've not had uh a sandwich from carson street deli you're uh you're missing out yeah, they uh, also just you know you can look at any of their photos. They got a, they got a good bread to meat ratio too. So <laughs> they do, they nail it. It's a very well constructed sandwich. I used to live right when they opened. I lived on uh, on so they they're on. Well, I'm trying to think of what street they're on there. Um, uh, just a, maybe is that like like 18th, 17th, 18th Street, something up there. Um, but I lived on 19th uh, South 19th Street, um, right off of you know, East Carson. And, uh, that was a, uh, that was a pretty regular spot. They, they opened in kind of the, the latter part of me living there, but, uh, yeah, that was a pretty common, uh, that was a pretty common lunch to go for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Adam, what's your sandwich? So I I'm glad that we are consistent all the way through on this segment, that there is not two slices of bread to be found on yeah. any of these. <laughs> Cause I, I myself went with a hoagie as well. Hoagies, uh, and, and I and I have to highlight the pizzeria hoagies, oh, the yeah. ones that show up in three layers of foil, and presentation be damned in a bag as well. In a bag, yes, yeah. in a sleeve. It's your holster. <laughs> <laughs> and the one that I went with is the ranchero steak hoagie from Pizza Milano. Okay, 
that's a, obviously it's got your steak, French fries, cheddar, provolone, a nice, uh, nice ranch sauce on there. Not dry, not dry no, whatsoever. No. The wet boy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you don't even need to crack open a beer when you eat it. <laughs> so Adam, you're bringing up something I think is, it's somewhat uniquely Pittsburgh in that your sub came with fries on it. Right. And, and what was funny is I didn't even think about it until just now. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, it, it's funny. That's a, uh, cause I think of fries on the salad as being, you know, super Pittsburgh thing. Right. Obviously. Oh yeah. I used to, I, before, when I was in grad school, I, I bartended, I waited tables and bartended at uh, um, the Wexford ale house, you know, poor Richard's Wexford ale house on 19. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. in there. Anyway. We had steak salads, you know, classic kind of Pittsburgh steak salad with the uh, with with the fries on it. And people used to order it without lettuce. <laughs> they would, they would, and so it would be a, a styrofoam box with steak, French fries, cheese, ranch, a couple onions, maybe a quarter of a tomato. <laughs> and <that> was, <laughs> but when I think about a fries on a sandwich, I think Cleveland. Like that's like a that's like a pretty standard Cleveland thing, right? With the uh, the Polish boy. Have you had a Polish boy? Oh, I don't, no. don't know that I have. No. Yeah, that's like a a sandwich they have there with. Uh, I want to say, and oh, let me have to double check. I think it has like kielbasa and 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 uh, and, uh, and fries and like hot sauce or something on it. But yeah, that's okay. like it's a really good sandwich too, though. Hmm. It's, it's, no, I don't think I don't think I really had that, but I don't hang out in Cleveland that much. It's really? not my yeah, it's not my it's not my hang. <laughs> you don't just go over to Cleveland real quick to grab a sandwich. <laughs> uh let's see. The one I'm looking at here seems to have a salad on it as well. Uh, this one says, "I right, Polish boy, Polish boy sausage sandwich native to Cleveland consists of a link of kielbasa placed in a bun covered with a layer of French fries and a layer of barbecue or hot sauce and a layer of coleslaw. Yeah, it definitely has coleslaw on oh, it. Too. I could get yeah. on board with that. That does yeah, sound good. Pretty delicious. I mean, the more time I spend in Cleveland, you know, I used to go there for work a lot. It's, it's a, I mean, the, Pittsburgh, it's like flat Pittsburgh a little bit. Like they're pretty... Mm -hmm. And people were real pissed when you say that. And obviously, we got our asses stomped by the Browns last weekend. So nobody, <laughs> nobody's happy about that. But, like, if you like Pittsburgh, you're probably going to like Cleveland. Like, they're pretty close. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's not terrible. The only thing I did notice is it does smell a little bit because of the lake. But Yeah, that's what that was. I used to – I went to Youngstown State for undergrad. A lot of friends that were, like, Browns fans, you know, and so it was always Steelers-Browns. We used to joke and call draft day Brown Super Bowl. Because they would get up early and start drinking at nine in the morning on draft day, because that's the closest thing to like excitement they had on you. But uh, they would, uh, yeah, we used to, they would be like, you know, why do you always talk about how Pittsburgh is so much better than Cleveland and all that stuff? And I used to, we used to say, because Cleveland stinks. It actually stinks. <laughs> it's the smell. It, it, and, you know, I half wonder, because also Philly smells bad too, but. I have to, I have to half wonder if like maybe we're just used to Pittsburgh stink. Yeah. Maybe like there's a, you have like a stinky roommate and you yeah. leave the room and come, come back. Then you remember it stinks because yeah. you've gotten used to the smell being in there, but like, we're just a different type of stinky roommate probably. Yeah. It's just like everybody It's just, it's probably all of these cities smell because they're all on polluted water, but yeah. <laughs> we just don't notice we only notice when we go to the other smelly cities right it's just a different stink yeah <laughs> at least we don't have new orleans smell no well, that's, that's a whole different type oof, of that's an objective stink because that's Ur waste urban street is a different <laughs> yeah. type of stink yeah, yeah. that's straight human urine <laughs> yeah that's objectively pee so <laughs> Not a sentence I thought I'd hear on this podcast, but here we are. That's straight. That can can that be? Did you guys title the the, the episodes? Can it? This one be called "Straight Human Urine." <laughs> yeah, sure. You asked for it. You got it. Uh, appreciate that. If the, uh, if when we do that and our numbers skyrocket. Next week, Steve, I think we have to look a little bit further on renaming some episodes. <laughs> just more pea flavor. <laughs> yeah. It turns out you just you're just poaching a bunch of listeners from people who are looking for 
like strictly pee related podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we'll see what happens to the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> listeners is, are listeners. This is we either going to be our this is either going to be our highest rated episode because it's all about sandwiches, and then we get a little bit from that fetish bump as well. Yeah. Or it's going to be our lowest rated episode because there's no beer talk. <laughs> Fast forward to episode 200 of the Golden Showers podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, move on a little bit. Just a little bit. We're still doing some sandwich talk, though. Uh, I mentioned in the first segment that I am a member of a radical sandwich anarchist group called Sub Club. Now, Brian, do you yourself participate in radical sandwich anarchy? <laughs> I am not familiar with this phenomenon, but I would be interested to learn more. So a little bit I more. I pamphlet if you have it. <laughs> yeah, so just a little bit more is that sandwiches are, there, there's obviously been a large debate as what defines a sandwich. Mm -hmm. If you're a radical sandwich anarchist, it's simply defined as any filling within two pieces not even necessarily bread but just two holders it doesn't even have to be two but it's handheld so a pop tart is technically a sandwich okay. a taco is a sandwich a burrito is a sandwich a corn dog is a sandwich yes corn dog is a sandwich if you hold it by the dog part and you don't have the stick <laughs> so you're you're more concerned about the the motor function of of its consumption than its actual uh make and model if you will right it, it's all it's all i i view it as an evolutionary tree less than actual defined styles because we're talking handheld yeah so were you gonna say is a pierogi a sandwich yes <laughs> now adam he has some eye rolling and huffing about i know he doesn't believe in this because he wears khakis and watches the christmas story <laughs> Oh, oh, good. Now I get to be judged again. Great. Yes. Well, <laughs> so to be clear, is a pierogi a sandwich? Yes, pierogi is a sandwich. Okay. Pierogi right. is just a mini calzone, and a calzone is so, a sandwich. So all dumplings are sandwiches. Yes, all dumplings are sandwiches because they're handheld and consumed that way. All right. All right. Yeah. You you just want to watch the world burn, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. I, I I don't think of it that way. I would think of it as I'm more accepting of everything being sandwiches except for soups. Soups have to have an inedible container. You know, the only time it gets blurry is when it goes in a bread bowl. I don't we haven't defined that yet. <laughs> That's what but if you if you freeze the soup inside the bread bowl, would that not now be considered a sandwich? Well, I mean, just it doesn't have to be frozen because if you can carry the bread bowl by hand, you know, it's with it's filling contained within a outer shell. If you took a took a taco salad and you put it in one of those tortilla bowls, is it a sandwich? Yes. <laughs> Man, if I was so inclined, and I had a biodegradable, a um, uh, uh, food grade bowl. And I was eating cereal out of it. <laughs> and I, and I personally, I made the personal choice that I was going to consume that bowl after I was done. Would that be a sandwich? <sighs> See, because really you put him to the test. I like well, this. Well, yeah. no, because he just said after he was done. Yeah. And that's the problem. The problem is you have to consume it at the same time. All right. So if I, took a bite out of the bottom of the bowl and slurped the milk out of the bottom of the bowl and then consumed the bowl. Have, ha, will I, would I have consumed a sandwich? It's possible. <laughs> this, this, is, possible. this is the, this is the gray area that comes into it. You know, we don't make hard and fast rules though, because of this gray area, gotcha. but it's, it's more about is the, is the shell consumable and is it handheld? That's that those are the, you know, those are the only hard and fast rules we have. Gotcha. Gotcha. Soup, it gets it gets dicey. It gets confusing because you can get some really thick soups, and you know how how thick is it from a soup to a sauce? And sauces go on sandwiches all the time. You know. Here's a question: You take two pieces of bread, mm -hmm. you soak them in a liquid, okay. water. Let's say it's water. Yeah. So you're two wet pieces of bread. Yeah. You, you put them together. You eat it. Is that a sandwich? No, because you didn't have you didn't have an extra filling. Well, the filling was water. 
but it wasn't contained within the shell. It was just part of the bread. It was the nature of the shell. All right, because I would equate that to essentially French toast. Right. They, yeah, it, you get the French toast Monte Cristo territory. So you, what I'm, I guess why I'm saying this is if you're talking about a soup in a bread bowl as being potentially a sandwich, are you then making some sort of judgment on the texture or ingredients within the soup? Well, it could just be bone broth. Right. I is would bone say- broth in a bread bowl soup? Or I mean, is bone broth in a bread bowl a sandwich? I think because the bread maintains its separate nature, as well as the bone broth maintains its separate nature. Whereas if you're just soaking it in water, it just becomes water bread. There's, there's no different, there's no differentiation between the two things. So that's, that's why the, that's why the, um, the Monte Cristo maintains its stature as a sandwich, because even though the bread was soaked in an egg wash, it still maintains like bread consistency. And that's just one thing. That's one ingredient is your egg wash bread. And then the rest of the ingredients of the Monte Cristo, the ham and more egg, if you put it on there or cheese, whatever, those are all separate ingredients in case within the shell. So you're saying that in order to be classified as a sandwich, it would need to be able to be disassembled. Yeah, there is a and disass- then reassembled. Yeah, there is a disassembly part to it. Not necessarily reassembled, but a disassembly because that goes back to that taco bowl theory. Mm. If you put it in the tortilla bowl, because you can't really reassemble tortilla. It's just chips. <laughs> if you if you disassemble, it becomes right, but if you're, if you're taking the taco salad and consider that to be one ingredient, right? Take that out of the tortilla bowl. Yeah. Then you have that separation and you can put it back together. Right. I mean, I could take those tortilla strips, crush them up, add a little water, make like a masa meal type of situation. <laughs> sure, if you really Bowl want to go out, through all those steps. Press, put, press it and make it back into a tortilla. <laughs> There's need to be rules here, Steve. We need to start yeah. writing this down. I mean, he did say anarchy. So. Yeah, I did, say, right. I did say radical sandwich <laughs> anarchy. There was no... <laughs> yeah. He didn't. He didn't say this was a, a law and order type of <laughs> yeah. sandwich group. He did say radical anarchy. So, but it, it also opens up. You know, like it allows for things like choco taco being a sandwich because it's, it's not traditional fillings. It's ice cream and it's also taco, but it also is more inclusive because we allow for things like gyros. And gyro is a sandwich if you think about it. And then it certainly is. I mean, it's a piece of bread, right? Right. It's a piece of bread with some stuff in it. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be two pieces because it was wrapped up. Falafel pita. Yeah, you you get to include falafel, and then the pita is not, again, two pieces of bread. It's one split and then stuffed. See, I I almost want to go the the inverse direction and say, like, I've got to assume, and I'm not some, you know, I'm not an expert in, in, you know, food historian here, but I would bet that tacos predate sandwiches i would assume Mm. um so that said all sandwiches everything really should be a taco Hmm. oh now there's an interesting so all sandwiches are tacos anything that's wrapped in a thing and then consumed is a taco if if you could prove the history i would be more willing to agree and I don't know, this is just some assumptions that I'm making, but I do yeah. feel like probably like, you know, uh, I feel like probably using tortilla and especially in like, you know, non bread and, and other type of like, what's, what's the kind of spongy bread that like, um, like Ethiopian restaurants you use to pick up the food with? Oh, I know what you're talking about. But right. I, I do too, but I, that stuff has to all predate him, has to all predate, you know, the Earl of Sandwich or whatever. Right. His name is, right. Right. Yeah. The, the, yeah. I would definitely give it the non bread predating all that. And I assume the Ethiopian bread predates as well. Yeah. yeah. So we moved into sandwich theory, um, really from, from just being strictly a P focused podcast. It's now more sandwich, <laughs> sandwich theory. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I guess if you could prove which culture had the first evidence of like dippable folded bread, you know, that would be your first sandwich. The, the one that sticks out in my mind is what I learned from George Motes. If you've ever watched his YouTube channel, 
with oh, first burger refused. guy yeah, yeah. yeah burger guy he, uh, or that's he, he whatever it's called yeah yeah <laughs> it's just yeah burger guy it's <laughs> just history but he yeah. talk, he talks about one of the earliest forms of the hamburger being like hamburger wrapped up in a bun like and it was in kind of the russian farmer age of uh, they would just wrap ground meat within a bun and it was more like a hot pocket which is also a sandwich <laughs> it's a taco we've established yeah <laughs> so that that's kind of the earliest instance of a hamburger of like you know meat wrapped in a bun so you can consider that if you can prove anything before that then that's what you you go with yeah that's true i yeah. I, I, w- I i would agree with that yeah so whatever whoever can prove whatever first but you know in general american parlance i think sandwich is fine <laughs> yeah. and we're never going to get that time back no <laughs> yeah it's a good sandwich debate and i think it's introducing a lot of people you know to my theories of the world <laughs> So the, the other thing we wanted to touch on just a little bit, but it will, it will become more apparent in the third segment is that you're a big fan of horror films as well. I do. I love, I love me some, some horror flicks and, uh, and, you know, strange movies and exploitation films and all that kind of genre, genre films for sure. So uh, I assume you got started pretty early then if you're, if you're also into the kind of early seventies, uh, genre film as well like the exploitation and uh, trauma films at all oh yeah for, for yeah. sure i just watched trauma's war not that long ago actually nice. <laughs> um yeah i love uh i love all that stuff i was introduced at a, a young age my uh my late uh, aunt was uh, a, a huge uh, horror nerd and just obsessed with you know halloween and the macabre and all that sort of thing and um she you know her and i were really close and um so she uh she introduced us my myself my my brother my cousins to all that stuff at a very young age so it was it was we always joke it's interesting my brother and I are both big horror fans and my cousins went the complete opposite direction in fact my 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 older cousin who shall remain nameless she he she was he was older than us uh than the the, than the rest of us uh, or the rest of the boys at least and then he has an older sister who's much older but in any case he uh we used to love them and look forward to going having sleepovers at her house and watching like <laughs> leprechaun and and uh, and you know and uh, all the, all this crazy stuff and she um he he took the complete opposite route he hates horror movie we one time watched uh paranormal activity the first one not long okay. after not on dvd so this would have been i don't know whatever the 2005 or 2006 i don't know when it came out and uh we woke up in the morning at his house and uh, went in and I, you know, was throwing something away in the trash and he had thrown the DVD away. He was so <laughs> disturbed by what he saw that he was like, I don't want this in my house. And he threw the DVD away. <laughs> so he really hates it, but we went the opposite direction and, and really, yeah, fell, fell in love with it at, you know, when we were you know, eight, 10 years old. So. Yeah, personally, so I, I would have thrown that movie away as well, but different reasons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not a fan at all, but I just remember him being genuinely so scared as an adult human about it <laughs> that he threw it in the trash. <laughs> we, we give him a hard time about it to this day. So I've got a question. As somebody who is not a, a horror film buff, mm-hmm. is Jaws a horror movie or is it not? Yeah. absolutely yeah one of the greatest horror movies of all time i would argue um you know it's not like a classic you know you know ghosts and goblins and vampires and monsters type of thing. i mean it's a monster movie uh, certainly mm-hmm. but um you know it, it's unique in that it takes place you know it has certainly has different um settings but a very similar theme and uh you know yeah i would say honestly one of the s- that is one of the movies that I, I don't necessarily, when people say, what are your top 10 favorite horror movies? I don't know that it would make it on the list, but I would say it is as close to, and that's just my personal taste because I love, you know, schlocky, crazy nonsense. Um, but it is, is cl- along with like The Shining, you know, The Exorcist, a couple other movies, I think it was like all, near perfect horror movies in my mind. Or not because I, I yeah. I've heard the, I've heard people argue that it is a horror movie and I've heard people say that it's not that they would say it's more of a thriller. 
Mm. Which, yeah, there's such specific horror tropes in it. You know what I mean? Mm. Like the, the, the it's it's just it, it's it's absolutely a horror movie. Um, when I think of a thriller, I think of something like there are certain movies that have horror themes and have horrific imagery that I would argue are closer to a thriller or a psychological thriller or something like that. Like a like even Seven, you know, mm-hmm. so like I would I, Seven, I would definitely consider a horror movie. But I agree that if someone argued that that was a thriller, I would be more receptive to that argument than I would to Jaws being a thriller. Because Jaws is a freaking monster movie. You know what I mean? <laughs> Jaws is. is water Cujo. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So do you have any suggestions? Uh, I know the film releases were pretty light last year, but did you have any suggestions from 2020 of something that you saw that oh, popped boy, out that- to you? came out last year yeah i mean so actually interestingly enough i started last year you know january of, of 2020 and i said i want to watch a hundred because I, I i tend to be one of these people that watches like i've seen halloween i've seen like every john carpenter movie like 30 times or i mean halloween night original 1978 halloween i've probably seen a hundred times right I, I, I watch it probably once a month since i've been you know eight years old but Last year, I set out to, to say like, okay, I want to watch a hundred new horror movies that I've never seen before or, or ones that I hadn't seen since I was a kid that I want to revisit. And that was pre-COVID, obviously. I made this kind of New Year's <laughs> resolution and, uh, and I ended up at 340. Holy shit. Nice. <laughs> new horror movies or movies that I was going to... Re- so there's so many movies that, I, that, uh, um, that, that came out last year. And I've already uh, up to about a dozen this year so far, but... Um, yeah, I don't, not necessarily ones that I had uh, that came out last year, but if you're looking for one that came out last year, there's one called Host that was really fantastic. That is like talk about a contemporary movie that like took uh, some some similar like you know familiar horror tropes and made them like really really um, uh, feel really like different and modern and like a hundred percent of of their time. It's a it's an enti- the whole entire movie and it's a really short runtime. It only is like I want to say like about an hour ish, a little over an hour. Um, and I'm looking up the director's name, uh, Rob Savage. I couldn't remember his name. Um, and it takes place on Zoom like this, hmm. and it's like these people during the pandemic doing like a seance and things kind of go crazy. And it sounds like it would be contained and like hard to really like lose yourself in it but you absolutely do it's like if you're looking for an interesting horror movie that came out last year that there's nothing else like it i would say host it's worth checking out interesting awesome where did you see that at was i assume that was on a streaming service yeah it was on shutter i think you can find it other places now but um if you don't if you're a horror movie fan at all like and you 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 should check out you should probably check out shutter um it's uh it's like a streaming service that's like a really well like curated um, uh, but long list of, of all, you know, horror movies. You could probably download it on iTunes or something like that as well. But, you know, I think it's relatively small, you know, independent feature, but uh, like I said, quick nice. run time. And, uh, but yeah, I watched it on Shudder. I know. Yeah, I think Shudder does a pretty good job. It, like you said, it curates all horror films, and they also have some original programming. Like I started watching their uh, Creep Show. Oh yeah, the Creep Show. Did, did you watch the holiday one? The, the Christmas. I haven't one? got to the holiday one now. No, I just started. Really, I thought it was really fun. <laughs> but yeah, they, I like the Creep Show uh, series they put out. I mean, it's it's kind of cheesy, and it definitely reminds you of. Tales from the Crypt, obviously, but yeah, yeah, if you if you like the original Creep Show, Creep Show Two, which I think is kind of frankly underrated, um, you'll definitely like it. Yeah, it's it's super fun. Thanks. <laughs> Found a friend, oh, did you? Cool. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> Found a friend, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so many. Uh, there's so many cool. Like, I've watched so many. You know, I've always been like Korean horror. I love you know Korean horror movies mm-hmm. and just that kind of sensibility and everything. But uh, I've watched a ton of probably the one of the scariest movies I've seen in years. Um, I watched on uh, I don't know if it was on Shutter this year, um, but it was it was a South American horror movie. And I'm looking right now because I'm I don't want to uh, Argentinian movie from 2017 called Terrified. Hmm. Um, not to be confused with Terrifier, like with right. um, 
but uh, I watched it on Amazon Prime, and uh, yeah, I mean, for for a jaded horror fan, uh, yeah, I about I jumped out of my skin a couple times. So. <laughs> nice. nice. I'll have to check that one out. All right. Well, with that, we're going to move into segment three, and we're going to combine everything we've been talking about tonight. I'm going to put together sandwiches and horror films into a game that Adam will hate. And yeah. Brian might be frustrated with, but we'll see. <laughs> so we'll come back with that in a minute. Welcome back to episode 184 of the Hob Nation USA podcast. We're in the middle of dry January, so of course we're just talking hoogies, sandos, a little bit of you know, club sandwiches maybe. Maybe somebody's got a club sandwich coming up this segment. We don't know. Steve, but you I... could have just said tacos and saved us a whole bunch of time. Tacos, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're talking all tacos. Welcome back to Taco Cast. <laughs> Where we talk about beer type tacos. <laughs> See, this is perfect because that little interview uh that little interlude episode we did last week adam yeah we're drinking the rumor of tacos i was and it and tasted we're absolutely talking, nothing like tacos yeah but now we're talking all tacos so last week was a rumor of what was happening now mm-hmm. <laughs> we totally planned that yeah absolutely <laughs> but uh Yes, I am still joined by my co-host Adam, and of course, our guest tonight is Brian Reed, Master Cicerone, beer educator, and sandwich lover all around. I will cop to that. Okay. So, <laughs> Adam, I'm going to start with you this segment. I want you to tell us about your sandwich. All right. And uh, this is a topic that we have not gotten into yet. Food trucks. We haven't talked about anything from a food truck yet. Oh. And... Uh, yeah, the good people of Two Brothers Barbecue. They're based out of that is the proper response. <laughs> They're based out of Presto. Uh, they make some fantastic food. Uh, and I'm gonna bring up their their brisket sandwich, their shaved brisket sandwich. I yeah. am a huge fan of that. Uh, there, there'll be pictures up later as well. But yeah. what's nice is, I mean, it's a shaved brisket sandwich. You're gonna like it. But everything else that they have there as well. If you're a fan of their poutine, get that. If you're a fan of their wings, they have, of wings, they have some fantastic smoked wings. Get on board with that. But pair that with the shaved brisket sandwich. Yeah, you won't go wrong. What, yeah, what all comes on the wings? Sorry, I talked over you. No, that's I, was, not, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't resist when you said I love me some smoked wings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The smoke wing, the smoke wings are great because they're also like pretty big, like. Mm. Not they're not completely like pterodactyl size wings, but they're pretty hefty. But uh, a, a, what comes on the brisket sandwich, Adam? Is it like like brisket? Okay, I didn't know if it was like sauce. <laughs> I didn't know if they put a slaw on it. I didn't know if they threw some. No, there there is a sauce on it. There is a a, a tangy barbecue on there, uh, lightly dressing up the brisket. But uh, yeah, it's fairly straightforward. It, it no must, no fuss. Right on. Brian, what's your sandwich for segment three? I'm going. I'm going uh, homemade uh, for this one, and it's it's a it's a Homer pick for sure. But uh, um, I had uh, my brother who lives in Nashville, and uh, my uh, my sister in law who also obviously is in Nashville, but is from uh, Minnesota. Um, and they, you know, they work from home, and you know, all that they've been kind of quarantining and all that sort of thing. So they came up and paid us a visit spent a couple of weeks with us for the holidays and uh, we, we reintroduced uh, my sister-in-law to the wonders of the ham barbecue um, ah. and the, and the, the Isley's chip chopped ham, the Isley's sauce. And, uh, and, you know, there was some other debate as to what other uh, accoutrements should be uh, involved there, but I am a sucker for, uh, for nostalgia. And uh, there's no, there are few, few sandwiches aside from maybe, and I almost put, a peanut butter and jelly or peanut butter and anything really that's kind of like i eat my body weight in peanut butter probably <laughs> um uh aside from maybe a peanut butter and jelly sandwich there's nothing more nostalgic to me than uh than uh, uh ham barbecue especially on especially on steeler sunday yeah that, get that crock pot rolling about eight nine in the morning yeah get it good and soft yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> it was funny we, we actually had a a couple of they were up here like i said for a couple of weeks so we had a couple of weeks where we were watching you know watching the steelers and uh and, and making some ham barbecue and i learned 
that there is a new variation on the Isley sauce. There's a hot and spicy uh, oh. came out with, and it's fantastic. Um, a little less sweet, a little more acidic than the than the traditional one. And it's got like some, it's not like make you sweat hot, but it's like kind of more hot than you would expect. It's pretty tasty. But uh, the other the other uh, debate within the house was one, my sister-in-law, which I love dearly, but she wanted to put cheese on it. And that was, that was, uh, a, that was a problem. And uh, <laughs> I asked her to leave and there was a dust up. And, uh, but no, the, and then the other thing was I like the relish, which a lot of people put the, put the sweet relish in the crock pot with the sauce. Mm. Uh, I prefer that the rest of my family doesn't necessarily. So I was forced for the second week to, uh, to hold off on the relish, but. I, I, I always enjoy just not necessarily in the crock pot, but I do like just kind of lathering a little layer of a sweet relish on the top bun. Yeah, that one's too. I think I think it's probably not orthodox, but acceptable also to maybe throw a couple a uh, couple uh, bread and butter pickle chips on mm -hmm. there. I think mm -hmm. people have done that, which uh, which I enjoy. But uh, yeah, cheese cheese is problematic. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's a no. <laughs> the one week actually, um, we went, you know, we we got it and we got, um, you know, groceries delivered, and uh, we, you know, asked for two pounds or three pounds or whatever of Isley chipped ham, and they freaking brought it sliced. Uh. <laughs> who brings? Who even sells? I mean, I know when you go to like the deli counter and you know we go down mario's giant eagle which is my giant eagle uh and i go uh you know a pound of isley's ham they say you want chipped or sliced and everyone gets it chipped well there wasn't you know direction on the app to order right. it assume they're going to bring it no they sliced it i was like yeah why hell? why yeah that, why would they default to sliced right <laughs> yeah must have been someone new or something i don't know but it definitely <laughs> it completely ruined the texture of the sandwich Someone out of tan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and my sandwich for segment three is actually just a callback to last segment. It's another Italian Hagee. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. Just again, classic Italian Hagee. Uh, this one is from Walmart. And this plays into what Brian mentioned last segment in that kind of hot or cold, no matter where it comes from, Italian Hagee still pretty good. Hard to beat. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to point out, though, specifically about the Walmart Italian hoagie, though, is that it comes with a little packet of pepper relish. And the pepper relish is awesome. Really? You, don't get, you don't get that a lot of places like it, without outside of like uh, an actual deli that would have the more classic uh, Giardina, you know, the, the real fermented good stuff that you see in a jar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, Walmart does it pretty good. Interesting. We would not have thought to get Italians. I see a little bit of, is that a little, one of my favorite words, I know it probably isn't, but I can't resist. One of my favorite words to say in a Yinzer accent is Asiago. Asiago. And like, is that a little bit of Asiago on there? <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's a little bit of Asiago on the bread and I toasted it up. That's the other thing is just a, just a tip for people at home. You should put your hoagies in the oven. You can do that yourself. Like that's not... <laughs> You do have to disassemble, man. Yeah, you do have to disassemble a little bit because you got to get the lettuce and the pickle off of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but just put them right back on. It's fine. Melt that cheese. Totally, down. Worth, totally worth it. It takes a mediocre sub to a to a to a good sub and a yeah. serviceable sub up to a mediocre sub. Like just heating it up under the broiler, getting that cheese melty. Get some of them. Get some of that grease running from the yeah. pepperoni mm -hmm. and the salami. <laughs> Absolutely. And like and again, this is a Walmart sub, but a toasted Walmart sub blows Subway out of the water. <laughs> Subway Sub fucking Subway's blows. arguably not even a sub. Like, yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah, there's been government arguments that we can't call this bread and we can't call it sandwich and we can't call it meat. <laughs> well, and, and also everything's just turkey. Yeah. It's all like turkey soy. <laughs> yeah. The the like the salami is made of turkey and whatever soy fillers that they put in it. Like, listen, I eat some gross stuff. Like, I love, love <laughs> spam. And I love like I will eat, I'm just a, a human garbage can. But same. If you're gonna tell Brunch me, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love Braunschweiger. I I yeah. we used to go to lunch 
uh, at a place called Cafe Bavaria in, Wisconsin, in uh, Milwaukee. If you ever go to Milwaukee, it's a great German beer bar. And you just get a plate of Braunschweiger raw onions, oh. like spicy mustard, and like a, a liter of Dunkel. And then we just go, to go there for lunch and then come back to the office just stinking. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, yeah, the, um, I, I completely, now I'm just thinking about Braunschweiger. I don't, <laughs> I don't even know what the fuck we're talking about. <laughs> We're just subway bashing. It's oh, that's right. Yeah. If you if you give me something and you tell me it's ham, but then I find out it's made of turkey and soy, that's problematic, right? Yeah, it's that's a big no. It's a hard no. I hate subway. (laughs) But all right. Well, those are our sandwiches, and now it's time for a game. This week's game is going to work similar to our past trivia's. And the past trivia, is, for those who don't know, I'm going to ask a question, and that question is going to be worth two points if you can answer it without multiple choice. If you need the multiple choice, just ask. I'll give it to you. And then if you can't get it, your opponent has the, cho- uh, has the ability to steal for one point. So I have six questions. This week's theme, as I've mentioned before, is sandwiches and horror films. So the questions are going to work like this. I'm going to give you a horror film. You tell me the sandwich that is popular in the area that the film is based. So if I gave you Dawn of the Dead, you would say Permanis. You could say Permanis sandwich. That's what Pittsburgh is kind of famous for. If you really wanted to be shitty about it, you could say Philly cheesesteak as the movie begins in Philly, but I'm not going to, you know not going to parse it that much <laughs> so we're just I looking say, i was going to say what's a monroeville sandwich but there is uh there is a uh a permanis in monroeville so yeah <laughs> it's, it's just general pittsburgh you know <laughs> well, what would be the you. closest <laughs> so yes but i'm not going to give you dawn of the dead because that would be too easy <laughs> <laughs> that was the only way i was going to get any points yeah we'll see uh I will give it a chance. Uh, Brian, you can go first or you can you know, let Adam go first. Um, you know what? I'll go first. Why not? Okay. So in the film Hatchet, which stars Kane Hodder mm-hmm. and Tony Todd and yeah. Robert Englund, where, what would be the number one sandwich of the area of the film Hatchet? I, I would have to say there's a couple of options, but I'm going to go uh, shrimp and oyster po' boy. And Brian is on the board with two points already. <laughs> Mr. Vis- Mr. Victor Crowley lives <laughs> in uh, New Orleans. That's or the right. general New Orleans area, I guess. I don't yeah. Know. yeah, again, I'm just kind of shooting for the New Orleans area. And obviously we're talking about the shrimp and oyster po' boy, which is actually... When you make it shrimp and oyster, it's known as a peacemaker. When you when you put both on there, but yes, uh, the the po' boy was an invention from a sandwich maker when there was strikes for the trolley services that run through New Orleans, and so the sandwich makers they would offer sandwiches for the striking trolley runners because the uh, the owners of the deli were previous trolley runners. And so when trolley runners would come in, they would say, oh, here's another poor boy. Give him, you know, give him a sandwich. And obviously shrimp and oyster and crawfish as well. You know, very common for the New Orleans cuisine. Yeah. So there you go. There's a little bit of history of the po' boy. And then Hatchet for the movie that Adam never saw. Nope. <laughs> does, occur, does occur in New Orleans. And it's very much a throwback to old slasher films and stars Kane Hodder as Victor Crowley who previously portrayed Jason in the Friday the 13th films. Best I can get you is the book hatchet about some kid that got lost in the, in the Yukon. That's it. Okay. <laughs> well, Adam, it's time to move on to your question. All right. I'm not ready, but let's do it anyways. <laughs> your question is concerning the Baba Duke, the allegory for drug addiction. It comes from a certain country. I'll give you that hint. What sandwich was made kind of famous in the country that the Baba Duke originates from? I, I'm going to need some multiple choices here. I'll okay. jump straight to that. Yeah. 
your choices are ham dog, dot hog, hot ham, or the shrimp roux. I'll go hot ham. What the hell? Hot ham? That is incorrect. Brian, your choice is steel. Yeah, well, I'm trying to, I'm, I've seen the Babadook. I've only seen it once. Um, I'm trying to think about where the Babadook was from, where the book was from, that the Babadook comes from. What was the other multiple choices? Uh, your choices are ham dog, dot hog, and shrimp roux. I would also say, don't worry about any of the books or anything. This is just where the film is based. Don't try to, I don't, because ah, okay. I don't know, I don't know the book and I don't know if that's different from the film. Yeah, weren't they, weren't they from the UK somewhere? I'm trying to remember. It's been some time since I've seen it. Um, the ham dog, what were the choices? I'm sorry, one more time. Ham dog, dot hog, and shrimp -a -roo. I'm going to say the dot hog. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> That is also incorrect. Okay, I, don't even, <laughs> I have no idea what it is. I've never even heard of it. So I, I kind of gave a little bit of a hint with shrimp -a -roo is, okay. Yeah, is where the, the, the film originates. The film is occurring in Australia. Oh, I didn't I, I didn't remember that. Okay. Yeah. The answer, I remember though, the accent that they had, and I immediately just being an <laughs> ignorant, ignorant Westerner was like, oh, it's a British accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, more or less. Yeah. Uh, the answer, though, is ham dog, because in 2004, a man invented a way to put a hamburger and a hot dog on a bun in the same sandwich. And he was... And he I called was, it the ham dog. Knight. He was either knighted or became a saint or <laughs> what? Well, he so, became, became a patriot saint of fair food, because it did become <laughs> popular in the U.S. through that. So. Okay, gotcha. I am unfamiliar, but I now want to seek it out. <laughs> Yes. So yeah, the the ham dog, the dot hog. That's just fucking whatever. <laughs> so is that is that a a multi dimensional sandwich or taco? I should say taco uh -huh. because the hot dog is inside the hamburger, which is inside the bun. Right. So the bun is specially made to take a shape of a hot dog and a hamburger. the The hamburger is cut in half to accommodate space for the hot dog and of course you'll be able to see all this on social media and youtube as you're watching but this is like an inception level taco right because yeah. yes. you have the first layer with the the hamburger and the hot dog then you have the second layer with the hamburger and the bun then you have the third layer with the hot dog and the bun yeah it's... as as you choose your bites you can choose your tastes <laughs> it's too much man it's uh, those aussies it's just too much <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next film. And Brian, this is your question. Children of the Corn. It occurs within the town of Gatlin as a young couple from California is on vacation. Where, what sandwich would be the best representation of the state that Gatlin is located in? I have a guess, and I'm trying to weigh whether I should take the the multiple choice or not. I'm gonna go for the uh, I'm gonna go for the uh, uh, for the gusto, and I'm gonna say loose meat sandwich. And that is incorrect. Although there was one that was in the uh, multiple choice, so you may have chosen it anyway. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If I would have heard it, I would have picked it then. Yeah. Uh, goes to you, Adam. I'm going to need those multiple choices. Cubano and Reuben and Isley's Chip Chopped Ham. I have to go with the Reuben. That is correct. Yeah, I might have guessed it because I learned that the Reuben was created there tonight on this podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you, uh, so, yes, the, the Reuben is in uh, Nebraska, which is where the fictional town of Gatlin is. Uh, but Gatlin isn't a real town, so I just had to go with, you know, Nebraska, the closest. <laughs> and as it, oh, we already talked about, it was actually invented at the Blackstone Hotel during a weekly poker game. And the, the one of the attendees was a Jewish, uh, Jewish American grocer who was looking for a sandwich to be made with corned beef and pastrami. 
and the chefs at the Blackstone gave him something that was also full of Thousand Island and sauerkraut and hey that's good (laughs) is the loose meat sandwich is that from Iowa I'm not going to tell you Okay, because oh, okay, good. <laughs> I was gonna say because I couldn't remember it was Nebraska or Iowa where the movie was set. But... I'm not gonna tell you where that's from. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> it may come up later. <laughs> All right, Adam, moving on. All right, this one's for you. I am ready. The film Reanimator. It occurs in the Massachusetts area, and well. As most H.P. Lovecraft-based things do. (laughs) I want you to tell me, what sandwich is Massachusetts pretty famous for? What taco is... (laughs) (laughs) What taco did the Massachusettsans invent? (laughs) Man, I, I, I have an idea, but... Uh... I'm not confident enough to, to shout it out there, so I'm going to need some options. Okay. Your options are Taco, Crunch Wrap, Double Bacon Supreme, or Fluffernutter. Fluffernutter. And that is correct for one point. That was yeah. not going to be my guess. So I'm yes. <laughs> super yeah. glad. <laughs> I would have needed the multiple choice for that, too. For <laughs> I was like racking my brain. What is a Massachusetts sandwich? I couldn't think of anything. Yeah. yeah. My my immediate thought was lobster roll, but yeah. that's more of a New me. England thing yeah, right, rather yeah. than just Massachusetts. Yeah, specifically uh fluff was originally invented in Massachusetts. It was actually invented by two different companies. And uh they origin the origin one of the original companies called it a liberty sandwich to begin with. But you know, as fluff became more regular part in it parlance you know you have fluff peanut butter fluff or nutter so yeah fluff or nutters come from massachusetts in the 19 hmm. early 1900s because they were actually a, a replacement for uh as world war one was carrying on you had the rationing of meats and other things so they replaced it with peanut butter so the fluff or nutter sandwich is actually older than sliced bread mm. More or less, yeah. <laughs> Peanut butter and jellies were actually invented in 1901 in, in the Boston cooking. Uh, it, it, it was in the Boston cooking school magazine. So again, technically Massachusetts, but it was more of in a magazine rather than at just like a restaurant or somebody who was making food to begin with. Who knew that Massachusetts had such a childlike wonder when it came to sandwiches? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to go to another movie, and this one's for you, Brian. We mentioned Dawn of the Dead and how that was set in Pittsburgh. Return of the Living Dead was mm-hmm. a bit of a take on the zombie genre in, the, in I think it was like mid-late 80s. Yeah. Uh, what sandwich, though, would be popular where Return of the Living Dead takes place? So I, I love this movie, and I love... The tar man there is one of my favorite imagery images in in all of horror, and I'm trying to think. It's he been is a not while. dry. <laughs> no, he's not dry. He is. <laughs> he is. He's. Mo- he's a moisty boy. Uh, the tar man himself. Um, I want to say that the movie is based in New Jersey. Is my is my where my head goes to, so I immediately want to go with Taylor Ham, uh, which is a New Jersey, uh, a New Jersey thing. But I think I do need to go with the, because last time I guessed, I, 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 I led myself astray. So I, I got to get the, the multiple choice. Okay. Your multiple choices are gyro, meatball sub, Monte Cristo, or a Kentucky hot brown. Oof. There's never no even heard of a Kentucky hot brown. Oh, Kentucky hot brown's good. That's a turkey sandwich. It's a very moist turkey sandwich. You wouldn't like it. Oh, but, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> it's got like tomatoes and gravy on like, it's like an open face thing. Um, all right. So not definitely not that. Um, the gyro was one of them. Um, what was the other two? Sorry. Meatball sub and Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo. 
I think the Monte Cristo would have been invented in like, you know, and like, I don't know why that seems like a New York thing to me. Um, meatball sub or, boy, I'll say meatball sub. That is incorrect. Ah. Adam, to you. I'll go Monte Cristo. Also incorrect. All right. <laughs> <laughs> The answer is Kentucky Hot Brown. Really? Yes, because the film Return of the Living Dead is set within Louisville. I did not know that. Yeah. I've seen that movie so many times. For some reason, I thought of it as like a New Jersey, like all the punk kids hanging out in the right. in the uh, graveyard and uh, the, the great Linnea Quigley and maybe her most iconic uh, uh, scene dancing on in, you know, completely naked in the graveyard another just, reference to trash yeah i immediately thought for some reason that feels like a new jersey scene to me i don't know why. yeah no it totally does i get you it feels new jersey but it was filmed in california but it's set in louisville so whatever okay. <laughs> yeah uh, as uh, brian was mentioning though the kentucky hot brown is a very uh moist sandwich that was this is kind of why I had Tarman up because. It was, oh yeah, now well I see it. Just a slight maybe hint that yeah, you know, but uh, yeah, moist sandwich, open face, turkey, cheese, gravy, all kinds of things. But uh, uh, just a little bit on the Monte Cristo for a second. It was actually invented in uh, California at a hotel. I believe that was called the Monte Cristo. There you go. It's so. it feels like a hotel sandwich. Mm -hmm. It feels like. It does. It's like it was invented at the Delmonico, you know, or something right. like that. So, Yeah. All right. This is our sixth question in the multiple choice round. And I do have a final question for both of you to compete in. But uh, Adam, your film is The Crazies. But as we know not the original one filmed in Evan city. <laughs> so again, the answer is not for Manny. <laughs> we are talking the 2010 remake with Timothy Oliphant. What is the sandwich that would be most associated with the crazies of 2010? I have no idea. Let's get some multiple choice rolling here. Your choices are loose meat sandwich Isley's chip chopped ham. Is it a meatball sub or is it a Pop Tart? Pop Tart? Radical sandwich anarchy <laughs> comes into play. <laughs> is it a Pop Tart? Ah. Uh, I'll go meatball sub. Incorrect. All right. <laughs> this one's the loose meat, right? This one is the loose meat sandwich. <laughs> It, uh, the 2010 crazies occurs in Iowa and the loose meat sandwich was invented by Dave Higgins in 1924 in Sioux City, Iowa. Good flick. Good yeah. flick. I watched it actually like maybe two months ago. Love, love me some uh, Timothy Oliphant. Right on. So going into our final question, Brian has three points. Adam, you have two points. I'm on the board. You're not getting beat as much as you thought. But <laughs> of course, the last question is uh, played closest to the uh, closest to the number. And it is a bit of a complicated math question. I want you to give me the Friday the 13th movie that Jason is closest to the origination of bagels and locks and multiply it by the length of a whole get go sub. <laughs> <laughs> Say that entire question again. Take the number of the Friday the 13th movie that Jason is closest to the origination of Bagels and Locks and multiply it by the length of a whole get-go sub. You can go over. That's fine. It's just closest to the number. Okay. All right. I think I've got my number. I've All right, Adam. Number. If you want to go first, you can. I'm, I'm going to say 28. Okay. I'm going to say 96. 96. And Brian, with 96, is closest to the actual number. It is 
Friday the 13th, part eight, Jason takes yep. Manhattan. Manhattan yep. I knew that. Yeah. Puts him closest to the uh, or origin of bagels and locks, despite none of those ingredients being invented in New York. It was just put together by uh, delicatessens. Uh, and then the length of a whole get-go sub is 14 inches, oh, okay. bigger than your standard 12, which puts the actual number at 112. Yeah, I just did eight times 12. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that, that, that's the game. Brian won, as most of the time guests do win on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when we're talking horror films. The deck was stacked yeah. against <laughs> Well, we always try to deck the stack against the hosts. <laughs> deck the stack. Deck the stack. Deck the stack. That's yeah. a good name right there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I knew going in that I, I didn't have a snowball's chance. Those were all, man, you just happened to pick a lot. Of, I mean, the crazies, I certainly wouldn't pick them up among the, my favorite, but I just watched it not that long ago. But you also picked a bunch of my favorite movies. Like well, yeah, I, yeah, I purposely, I purposely picked Reanimator. Yeah. Like, I, uh, here's the thing some of the guests don't know is like, if I'm friends with you on Twitter, I'll go into your tweets to see if I can use them against you. There's I just probably some, some Stuart Gordon tweets that popped oh, yeah, yeah. passed away last year, right? So I probably tweeted. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I just I just typed in favorite favorite horror film or favorite horror movie and then with your name and then just went through your tweets and I was like, oh yeah, he's a big fan of reanimator and Stuart Gordon. Cool. What's been invented in the Massachusetts area? Fluffernutter. Great. <laughs> <laughs> You're like the uh what's that guy who interviews all the rappers that has the hat? You know, the oh, hat? I just saw some video with him too. The hat, he wears the silly hat. What's his name? He, he gets these crazy deep dives. You're like you're like the uh the beer equivalent of him. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, what's his name? But uh yeah. Not James Lipton. How about that? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Nardwall. Nardwall. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. He's a yeah Canadian white guy that is very unassuming that has some of the deepest rapper knowledge that just fucks with people. <laughs> he fucks with people when we interview <laughs> yeah, he's them. Yeah, like the craziest interviewer ever. Yeah. Yeah. So, but thanks for coming on the show, Brian. Yeah, it was uh, a blast. Yeah, I'm glad you had fun. Uh, now is your time that if you want to promote or plug anything, you can promote your Twitter or, you know, where you may be educating next or just anything, your favorite sandwich shop, your favorite sandwiches. Go ahead. Now's your time. Yeah. I mean, yeah, go out and support some, uh, some local, uh, local bars and restaurants and breweries and, uh, you know, go buy some, go buy some beer from this, this upcoming weekend and go to, uh, I know I'm gonna, I've been looking forward all week to, uh, getting some takeout from i live out in beaver county so i'm going to go to uh shoe brew or general shoes probably mm. uh and get some some uh some egg rolls and some uh dan dan noodles and then i'm probably going to get some uh get a burger at uh at burgers there in zilly as well and uh see if they have any more of their italian pills left because it was really killer so um yeah that's right if you yeah uh, i'm on social media twitter and instagram and stuff at uh, brian is beering so say hi if you feel inclined but uh, thanks, guys. It was fun. Yeah, right on. Uh, yeah, you mentioned you're like in Beaver County. I guess you're more closer up north. But have you been to Andy's Barbecue Stand in Manaka? No, I have not. But I'm not far from Manaka. I'm maybe only 15 minutes from Manaka. Okay. Yeah. Check check out their menu from time to time. But usually on Saturdays they do smoked cheesesteak. Oh. And it's not whiz, but it's a it's their own pimento cheese that they make. I'm sold. Yeah. yeah uh, check I'm it out. Pimento cheese. And then I'll post it on that group and just get shredded. Yeah. You can get shredded <laughs> on that. And also they'll have smoked cheesecake and that is really fucking good. That yeah. Good. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but check all those out. And if you want to check us out on social media, all you have to do is search at Hob Nation USA and they'll get you Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you want to listen to brand new episodes of the Hop Nation USA podcast every Friday, as you should, then search Hop Nation USA on your favorite podcatcher like Stitcher, Podbean, Google Podcasts, Spotify. We're on everything that starts with pod and ends with cast. So check us out. And if you're on any of those platforms, leave a five-star review because... We are a sixth dry-ass sandwich show, but they only let us use five. And that's a bigger crime than putting green peppers on your cheese steak. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, thanks again for coming on the show, Brian. Uh, yes, this, next, this is a blast. 
Yeah. Glad you could come on. Yeah, it's super fun. Thank you guys. Yeah. Next time, maybe we won't dictate the audience and we'll actually talk about beer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, good show. Um, I don't know. I Buy some merch, tpublic.com. Oh yeah, the glasses should be coming in too. Yeah, sometime this month. Uh, tpublic.com, search word Hop Nation USA. No spaces, that'll get you where you need to go. Yeah, get the new drink logo shirt. They're decent. Everybody likes them. <laughs> but all right oh, we'll see you next week with something new bye bye